I have so many questions now. I'm like thinking, coming up with questions and losing it. <laughs> so um, I guess some people are listening to it right now and maybe because I'm going to put subtitles and probably some people are thinking, but what is actually narcissism? What, what narcissistic personality disorder do to other people? Like, What is the damage? What are the damages? And what are the characteristics of narcissistic personality disorder? I know you wrote about the nine characteristics, but if you have five of five of them, um, you could diagnose your, not yourself, but you could be diagnosed as narcissistic personality disorder. But I also heard that it, it is changing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book needs to be revised. That's what I heard also from you from the uh, from the videos. So what are the characteristics and what actually, what kind of damage they actually do to other people? Also for Lydia, I think I'm very curious about your dynamics because you've been together for, for such a long time and I've been with a narcissistic person and it was very, very difficult. And um, after just breaking up, I realized, what, oh, okay, I was there, I'm glad, now I'm not there. <laughs> So, I will I will uh, cover the academic part, and Lydia Lydia will tell you how difficult it is to and how long suffering she is with me. <laughs> um, I'm a narcissist. I can't suffer. Yeah. Academically, <laughs> academically speaking, from the disciplines point of view, uh, narcissism is when you treat other people as objects. I think that's the best definition of narcissism, pathological narcissism. Oh, yeah. When you treat other people as objects. Objects of gratification, instruments to obtain goals, etc., etc. When you can't empathize with other people in the sense that you don't see them as human, they are things. You thingify them. You make, you make them things. Now, this requires several behavioral traits. For example, exploitativeness, the tendency to exploit people, a lack of empathy, I, I mentioned. Inability to access positive emotions. Narcissists are capable only of negative emotions, such as envy or rage, anger. Or you know, and so on and so forth. So we have nine nine such uh, criteria described in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a book used in the United States mainly for insurance purposes. And if you if you meet five of these nine, then you can be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. If of course, if you stop to think of it for a minute, you will see how nonsensical it is. Mm -hmm. Because if you meet criteria one, two, three, four, five, you're a narcissist. And if you meet criteria five, six, seven, eight, nine, you're a narcissist. But these yeah. two narcissists have nothing in common. Right. One to five and five to nine, they're not the same people. And yet they are diagnosed with the same disorder. So this led to the development of an alternative model of narcissism, which will be the diagnostic landscape in the next edition, in the sixth edition of the DSM. It is already incorporated in the ICD. ICD is International Classification of Diseases. It's a book published by the World Health Organization, and it codifies all the diseases of humanity, bodily and mental. And so it's much more advanced than the DSM. Also, it's much, it's much less influenced by money. Insurance companies and pharmaceutical industries have a huge effect on the DSM, not a good one. Oh, wow. So we, in the profession, we take the ICD much more seriously than the DSM, although the DSM, because of America's power, media power, the DSM is much more well-known. Now, the alternative, alternative model is what we call a dimensional model. It says that narcissism is a spectrum. It's a dimension. And that you could have varieties of narcissism which are less pernicious, less problematic, more problematic, and so on and so forth, narcissists maintain their identity or sense of identity and sense of self-worth by deriving input from other people. This is known mm -hmm. as narcissistic supply. They are incapable of intimacy because they are not capable of perceiving other people as separate from them with their own needs and hopes and dreams and wishes and so on and so forth. They have problems with um, empathy, they have problems with aggression. They have problems with depression. And there are two types of narcissists. There is overt or grandiose narcissism. It's a narcissist whose self-perception and self-image is fantastic, inflated, unrealistic, not based on any real life accomplishments. 
megalomaniacal. That's the overt, grandiose narcissist. And we have another type known as covert or vulnerable or shy or fragile narcissist. That's a narcissist. Sorry? The victim's victim mentality, right? Yes, that kind of narcissist is, uh, it, it fails to obtain supply. It's a, it's a yeah. constant failure to obtain supply. It's known as collapse. Mm. So it's a form of collapse narcissism. And consequently, he develops victim mentality. He becomes very passive aggressive. He's very cunning and scheming and manipulative. Um, he's as disempathic, uh, lacking in empathy as the overt or grandiose narcissist. But he often has something called pseudo-humility. He pretends to be humble, helpful, healer, savior, rescuer. These are very dangerous types because they fake and imitate empathy. They pretend to love other people, to, to support them, to, and they actually then inflict damage. When they get close to you, when they feign intimacy, which is not there, then they inflict damage. The grandiose overt narcissist is a bit stupid. It's a kind of Donald Trump narcissist. Yes? In your face. That's who I am. I'm perfect. I'm amazing. I'm brilliant. I'm this. I'm that. And you're stupid. And you're a loser. I'm a winner. And so, The covert narcissist, you don't see him coming. He's like a snake in the grass. Yeah. What? And also on the I, 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 really, I really don't like this. It, uh, <laughs> most of the people are like that because they are in the past. They, they, they didn't de define themselves. If uh, uh, why, why to be sneaky? What is wrong with you that you envy the other? What, uh, what is, uh, what are you ashamed of? Like you lack dreams, and someone else is just in a fan lives in a fantasy land. And has like very easy life. No, what was that? Go lucky thing. Happy go lucky. Happy go lucky. Fake it till you make uh, it. Fake it till you make it. You know <laughs> these are the the it Americanisms. Does, <laughs> okay, yeah. so people in people's nature is to envy because we all have to compare with the other and to know more about ourselves. It's uh, what uh, narcissists need is narcissistic supply the other's input. We also need other's input, right? We need to know, we exchange opinions, we communicate, we come up with some idea, we, are, we realize that idea. Same uh, does the narcissist. But uh, uh, what is the difference? That I will, I will make it for, for to ben uh, most of us, not only I to benefit, but many other people to benefit. All the involved. Not so the narcissist. Narcissists, they they see everyone as a, as an object. It's their function to supply him with ideas, uh, someone else's function to give him money, someone else's money to invest in his uh, business, and nothing with no responsibility to get uh, something in, in return, at least even thank you. They don't say it, they just withdraw, they punish, and when, of course, uh, other people will also vanish. They gave part of them uh, something, you know, was uh, uh, produced or and, and uh, there were some uh, money, you know, for everyone, but the narcissist took them all for himself, and he doesn't know what to, uh, these people with ideas, with money, with, they, they leave, and the narcissist fails. He will lose all the money, he doesn't know, he doesn't have the brains, how to use it. It is part of self-destruction, what I call it, uh, the, the dark side. We all have the dark side. Uh, you call it shadow, I discovered later. But uh, the point in all this narcissist, narcissism thing is uh, that uh, narcissists think, and they are actually convinced that they matter only. It's, yeah. We do, we do. 
Um, okay. We do. Okay. Uh, uh, so to since he said this, you asked before, how come we are together? When he says this, that only he matters, I learned from my parents. Uh, I had an abusive mother. I'm not going to talk about it. She uh, she was asking, you must do this, have to do this, it's for family, it's for for all of us to be more happy. Okay, so give me what do you want me to do. I will make it just to for, to see your smile on the face, to be satisfied, and that, but then leave me alone. This is my narcissistic uh, pattern that I learned. So, but with that, in time, I built boundaries. Uh, yeah. She was not fair for something. She was uh, like a snake, right? Trying, you know, from the other door. But you will do also this. And you will do also this. But uh, I rejected her for many things. I withdrew. I was not talking to her for years. Even though I was a teenager. I was angry at her. But I did not abandon her. I did not... Uh, I did not... Uh, I was there for still keeping her uh, uh, pleased. Because she did have some positive uh, things. Uh, she had some uh, uh, good intentions. Not to me, of course. I will give, uh, I will supply her, but what she gets, she will give to others. So I sustain her image of a good mother. But she knew very well that she was not good to me. However, she heard it. And, and that's it about her. That's the same dynamic that I learned from her that I'm having with Sam. Okay, yeah. you are you are the, the captain, you know the best. Okay, what what is that that you want? I agree with it. I will please you, I will do it, but I will also enjoy that. You will not you just reject me, abandon me, or or whatever, dismiss me, but I will insist that I will stay here. I will help you, but also uh, you will help me when I need. So it's a uh, it's uh, uh, like a blackmail. Also, I'm give, not happy give, with that. Give and take. But but there is a relationship that is fair. Transactional. It, it's mm -hmm. uh, but transactional for good for both of us. Okay. okay, that is because of my upbringing. I was good to everyone until today. I'm good with everyone. That is my. But when they cross the line, when I see the, the hint of not being fair and there is nothing, I, I ask for a favor, right? And there is nothing in return. That person is, you know, I can't trust that person anymore. I can't rely on that person anymore. And that's it. What bones us is that he is honest, even brutally honest. That yes. is... That is the real bondage. It's not uh, the trauma bond that I had. From the trauma bond that I had, I learned something. But with him, I I uh, in, I implement the all the knowledge that I had in the past, not only from home but with many other people. So it's a good feeling to live with yourself, knowing, being aware that uh, snakes, that people provoke you for different reasons and you should be smart to know where to engage and where whom to help. Is it for both of you? Is it for... Mutually, uh, mutually beneficial. Yes, is it mutually beneficial? So I think that malignant self-love is that product of me and Sam. It's our only child, by the way. We don't have children. <laughs> yeah. So there are two types of, um, <laughs> you said, uh, cerebral narcissists and somatic na narcissists. Mm -hmm. cerebral, cerebral narcissists are very smart. Yes, they have a lot of I know such people here as well. And sometimes I think it's really pity sometimes because they're amazing. They really have a lot of knowledge, speak so many languages. But um, they sometimes really act like a child, vulnerable child. And so it is very hard to be 
with a child as an adult. <laughs> so I guess that's, does it apply to also somatic narcissists? Yeah, well, this <laughs> that's a long question. <laughs> I will try to break it up. And then uh, I would like to talk a bit about envy, shame, and dissociation. These are critical features of narcissism. When, when the child is exposed to trauma and abuse, the child has two options. He can merge with the abuser. This is a process known as identification, introjection, incorporation. So he can merge with the abuser. He can become one with the abuser. And this kind of child grows up to be a narcissist. The other option is to cater to the needs of the abuser, to please the abuser. This kind of child becomes codependent or a people pleaser when he grows when he grows up. The child who becomes a narcissist, he, as I said, he merges or fuses with the abuser, but he's still suffering pain. He's still being punished. He's still being ignored or being uh, violated. He needs to isolate himself from these impacts. And yet, at the same time, he needs to be an abuser. So he constructs a godlike imaginary friend, a yeah. godlike imaginary friend known as the false self. Right. And he creates the equivalent of a private religion. The false self is godlike. It's all knowing, it's all powerful, and it protects the child. It defends the child against the abuse of parental figures or caregivers. So when the child is beaten up or sexually molested or instrumentalized or parentified or whatever, it's not happening to the child. It's happening to the false self. Okay. This is a decoy yeah. mechanism. Decoy. Like it's happening. Not to me. It's not happening to me. I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm not here is known as dissociation. It's happening to him, to this, to the false self. And then the child, because this is a god, the false self is a god. The child sacrifices himself to this god. This is human sacrifice. Like in yeah. primitive religions. Mm -hmm. He sacrifices himself. He sacrifices his true self to this god. And by sacrificing himself to this god, he becomes one with this god. He becomes one. From that moment on, all that's left is the false self, this imaginary friend, this piece of fiction. It's a story, it's a narrative, it's not real. The child itself vanishes forever, can never be recovered, is dead, zombified, if you wish. Now, the false self is godlike, so it needs to be superior, it need, needs to be perfect. So the child asks, it asks itself, what am I good at? What am I good at? If I take my assets, my advantages, and leverage them, develop them, invest in them, then I'm going to be perfect. Then I'm going to be superior. If I'm intelligent and I study a lot and I learn a lot, then I'm going to be superior to other people. I'm going to be almost perfect. Or Perfect, actually. I'm going to be a walking, talking encyclopedia. Yeah. yeah. So this is the cerebral narcissist. Other children are tall. They look good. Girls, girls get attracted to them when they are teenagers. Or boys yeah. get attracted to them when they're teenagers. And so on and so forth. And so they say, my asset, my advantage is my looks, my body. Yeah. That's how I'm going to become superior. That's how I'm going to become perfect. So I'm going to exercise a lot. I'm going to lift weights. I'm going to bodybuild. I'm going to have sexual conquests. I'm going to have sex all the time. It will confirm to me that I'm perfect, that I'm superior, that I'm, that I'm irresistible. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the child makes a decision very early on, between ages four and six, makes a decision. So, These are my assets, and that's the way, that's the only way I can become superior and perfect. And they mm -hmm. become cerebral or somatic. But 
there is no time constancy. When the cerebral fails, collapses, for some reason, mm -hmm. he becomes somatic. Oh, wow. And when the somatic fails, for some reason, for example, he cannot get a sexual partner, for some reason, or, or he had an accident, he's disabled. So when the somatic fails, he tries to become cerebral, which is very funny. They look like clowns. <laughs> he tries to become cerebral. Then he thinks, he suddenly believes that he's a genius, he's a philosopher, he's a, a psychologist, he's I don't know what. And you see these, these clumps of muscles online who suddenly become public intellectuals because, of, yeah. because they have failed the somatics. And so you see all these bodybuilders and all these, uh, you know, and they are online and they... <laughs> They pretend to be big intellectuals and big, but they don't have the capacity, so they, it's very clownish. So this is to answer your question about somatic and, and cerebral. There's a dominant type and a recessive type, latent type. And when the dominant type fails, the other type takes over. And then, and, and flip-flop, it's a flip-flop situation. Separately from all this, we, I think it would be good to discuss envy, shame, and dissociation. These are three yeah. critical forces in narcissism. Um, when the child is abused and traumatized, the child feels helpless and very ashamed of itself. When you fail to defend yourself, when you fail to stand up to yourself, when you're bullied all the time, you feel ashamed, don't you? It's a very yeah. shaming reaction. Failing it. Failing in general. generally, yes, she's right. Failing in general, failing is, in general is shameful. And this is the failure. You're failing to protect yourself, your body, your mind, your soul, everything. It's a massive failure. There's another failure here. You're failing to become who you could have been. Mm. You're failing to realize your potential. Okay. You get stuck. You get stagnated. You remain a child forever. And yes, you're right. The average mental age is about two. So, wow. so you're an adult, you, you watch adults around you, and, can't relate. and you can't reach their level. It challenges your sense of perfection. It undermines your grandiosity and, and, false, and this creates a lot of shame and vulnerability and fragility. So shame is a critical function. And narcissism is compensatory. It compensates for the shame. If you feel inside that you're weak, you will pretend to be strong. If you feel that yeah. you're stupid, stupid, you will pretend to be a genius like me. If you so whatever you if you feel that you're ugly, you will go on a, on sexual conquest to prove to yourself that you're not ugly. Narcissism is totally compensatory. Now we know there was a big debate for forty years. Now we come to accept that it is one hundred percent compensatory, even in grandiose narcissism. So this is shame. So it, it, just to say, sure. as as the things in the environment change, and uh, uh, people are becoming anxious, they can't, they are afraid of the future. The they they come with very bizarre ideas, <laughs> what to do, who they are. So you know, this is that stage when uh, uh, of uh, and then you compare with the others. Uh, you you. Um, find out that something is wrong with you, so you also, your narcissistic defenses pop up. So it's a loop, you know, one goes into the other. Yeah, this is known as relative positioning. I'll come to it in a minute. Okay. The second thing is envy. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you feel inferior, inferiority complex, you feel incomplete, you feel inadequate, you feel imperfect, you envy other people. You envy other people for their accomplishments, for their looks, for their uh, wives and girlfriends or boyfriends, for their property, whatever. Envy is actually a diagnostic criteria uh, in narcissism. It's one of the nine diagnostic criteria. Envy motivates not only covert narcissists, but also grandiose narcissists. And it is the twin of shame. Mm -hmm. This is an intolerable situation. How can you survive with constant shame and constant envy and the need to disguise them, camouflage them with behaviors and traits that are not fully yours? You know that you're acting. It's a lot of acting here. Mm -hmm. So how can you survive this situation? 
you forget. You simply delete. A lot of forgetting. And this is this amnesia is known as dissociation. Narcissists have enormous memory gaps. And because they have huge memory gaps, every situation that caused them shame, every situation where they were envious, every time they were criticized, every time someone disagreed with them, every time they thought they were being insulted, this is known as hypervigilance. Every so every two minutes they have to dissociate. Right. They end up not remembering, disremembering 80% of their life. That's why they so, need they need someone next to them. Yes. That is my like role to, 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 to no to rely. Uh, uh, to to remember all the details of their lives. Yes. So that is exhausting. And um, <laughs> yeah. not many women can can tolerate that. It's a burden. Yeah. It's a burden. This is part of something known as external regulation. Like the borderline, the narcissist hands over internal processes to his intimate partner. He expects her to act as his memory, as his narcissistic supply, as his... So she is, she becomes integrated in his mind as an external supplier. Exactly like internet service provider. You know. So there's, but, a, there's a computer and there's hard drive. <laughs> yes, like external hard drive. It's an example. I, 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 I on one, uh, there was a seminar in London. I said, I'm his ex external hard disk. <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> so this is this is dissociation, and that makes the situation even more unbearable, because yeah. to to justify to explain to people the memory gaps, mm -hmm. the narcissist creates confabulations. Lies. Confabulations are not lies. Confabulation. Well, they appear to be lies. They are not lies. Confabulations are stories that make sense to the, the to the narcissist. The narcissist says. I forgot the last five minutes. What could have happened? What is likely to have happened? What most probably has happened? What, what plausibly has happened? And then he creates a story and it becomes reality for him. Wow. He, he bridges, he bridges he the memory gaps. He bridges the memory gaps with many stories that he comes to believe are reality, even when they are contradicted by evidence. Just to sustain yeah. the the false image. continuity. Yes, and that we I call it reframing. So there was a situation that didn't fit you, or you forgot that it happened. You remember some snippets, thoughts, and then you make your own story. Not I mean you like a narcissist, and they well, but this happened. Wait up. So there you can't. You can't change the mind of a narcissist. He is, he believes that. So this, uh, I saw how desperate they are to be them, to stabilize, to stabilize themselves, identity uh, that they are that they are having control because yeah. they know and they are aware very much so of their dark side. They call it uh, these days uh, dark triads. The the urges that they cannot control, and it's easy for them to flip. So the narcissist, I, they are so predictable when they flip, and when and if they put you in the story, be sure to expect to be blamed, to be accused, and even to be taken to court. That. They are so convinced in their narrative. It's unbelievable. Sorry to... No, no. Um, when, when your life is 80% confabulation and 20% reality, then you live in a story. And this story is known as fantasy. It's a fantasy mm -hmm. defense. But if you inhabit uh, an alternative universe, it's known clinically as paracosm. If you inhabit a paracosm, an alternative universe, which is comprised of 80% invention, invented thing, 20% reality, then your partner must join your universe. 
Because mm. if your partner is 80% reality and you are 80% fantasy, you will not survive as a couple. Yeah. There will be a lot of friction, a lot of debates, a lot of anger, a lot of you're lying, you're not lying. No, I'm not lying. Yes, I'm lying. So your partner must make the choice to join your fantasy. And this is known as a shared fantasy. There is a process called coercive snapshotting. I will not go into all this. But she joins the fantasy, in effect. Even if she thinks she had not joined the fantasy, even if she thinks she's embedded in reality, if she survives with the narcissist, she has joined his fantasy. Yeah. Period. Um, so now, she has to lose herself as well, in yes. a way. Part. 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 The part of reality testing. If she has to give up, on her independent view of reality, on an independent gauge of reality. Now, victims mistake this. They say it's gaslighting. It's not gaslighting. Mm. Gaslighting is intentional, goal-oriented. Consequently, it is psychopathic. When the psychopath gaslights you, he knows what is reality, and he knows that he's lying. He knows that he's manipulating. The narcissist believes his fantasy. He is the fantasy. He doesn't know that he's lying to you. He, he firmly believes that it's all true and real. When he promises you to marry you, the second time you meet, yeah, to marry you and have children with you, he is not future faking. He is not lying to you in order to get you to bed, to have sex with you. That's the psychopath. The narcissist really believes that he is a, you will get married and have children with you. Because he is in the fantasy and he doesn't remember. So the next day he may tell you, you know, uh, let's try it out for a few years and see how it goes. And so, but yesterday you offered me marriage and he doesn't remember. So he would confabulate. He would say, you must have imagined it. You were drinking a lot. <laughs> and then you, um, you produce a recording. You produce a recording on your smartphone where yeah, he yeah. says, I'm going to marry you and we are going to have three children. And you are debating the names of the children. Yeah. <laughs> and he would still deny it. Yeah. Yeah, desperate. He would say, you took it out of context. Right, that's that's true, yeah. So there's, um, I think there's a misunderstanding among a lot of people, especially here, because we don't have a lot of resources. I talked to a few people, and then they say, ah, narcissists, they are the people who deeply fall in love with themselves they're they're the people who only love themselves and this is i think this is very wrong according to the book your book actually those are the people who have no idea how to love themselves therefore they, they don't know how to other, love others right so they, they i think have, it's, it's even much worse they don't have a self yes they can't okay. love themselves because they are selfless ironically <laughs> and, and narcissism the most most of the people who are saying that they are reverting to more obvious type of narcissist and it's the somatic one because they want to be beautiful even there, not... even there there's no such i mean most of these narcissism, people are referring to somatic narcissism. narcissism is early childhood failure to develop self structures including the ego narcissists don't have ego, an ego yes they have super ego. It's they, false. they don't have an ego because they have a false self exactly so Narcissism is about a failure to develop a self. There is no self-love because narcissism is a huge reservoir of shame. Yeah. Narcissism is a reaction to shame. There's yeah. re self-rejection, self-loathing, self-hatred, self-destructiveness. Narcissism is the exact opposite yes. of self-love. Yeah. Yeah. The exact opposite of self-love. And what they, why, they are, uh, why they need someone to love them it's actually that they are, and they are choosing uh, empathic, um, empathic uh, partners in life because yeah. they love really. They love themselves. They care about themselves. You know, a norm, a normal person, and the 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 jealousy and envy that they can't do it to themselves. They just take it uh, as it is from the other. They consume the other. They consume. Yeah. They see what the other is uh, does, how is taking care of uh, himself, herself in this. They copy it. So they are, when they you have an example of someone who loves yourself, every time you want, you miss it. Whenever a narcissist will feel self-destructive, self-hatred, 
okay they go to that source and they are joyful again wonderful again accepted they belong so they compensate with the other with the others emotions because they don't have the country relate to positive emotions so many women will say uh, that the narcissist drained them emotionally they, they became dead they died and they call them uh, vampires they suck the life out of out of them so these are, are just you know how people express such dynamics and to answer your question and this is actually where why uh what is the real reason of envious narcissists because they know they can't do it because yeah. they they don't have emotions that is how come they have i will destroy the other just not to irritate me that to remind me that i am emotionless and to answer your question the narcissist cannot love anyone and you also can never love a narcissist i will explain mm -hmm. the second part and then i will talk about the first part this is this would be a big surprise to many victims right yeah. when i say you can never love a narcissist it's a, it's a big surprise but i will explain why first of all the narcissist is not real there's nobody there it's an absence yeah. absence pretending to be a presence yeah the narcissist does not exist it's a void it's a black hole you can never love something like this ever changing and if you love the what you think is the narcissist what you are in love with is an idealized image of an intimate partner that you created in your own mind it's not the narcissist you fell in love with a fake hero a, a fiction character that's the first reason there's an even bigger reason to seduce you and lure you and captivate you and get you addicted what the narcissist does he puts a mirror to you a mirror yeah. and in the mirror you see your idealized self yeah. in the mirror you're perfect you're amazingly intelligent you're irresistible you're drop dead gorgeous you're unique you are incredible you're unprecedented in the mirror what do you fall in love with you fall in love with your idealized image in the narcissist mirror you fall in love with yourself through the narcissist gaze the narcissist provokes in you your own narcissism and yes. you you yes. develop a narcissistic love for yourself that's why it's addictive okay. the narcissist has a monopoly on this mirror he is the only one with this mirror so you think is the only one with this mirror if he takes it away from you suddenly you have to face the fact that you are not perfect that you have shortcomings and failings and, you know and who wants to face this after having experienced perfection mm -hmm. it's a drug see, it's a see, drug it is nice. actually that's your validation yes how you see yourself in the in his eyes is your narcissistic supply yes because we all doubt that we are never good enough how we look how we perform that's why we are all narcissists yeah narcissistic that is the healthy narcissism because it motivates us to change our mind and so on and so forth to regulate emotions but, but so of course if you were raised in a dysfunctional family where you did not receive a lot of love you were criticized all the time so you develop what we call a bad object you you feel that you are unworthy inadequate ugly stupid because your mother told you so for example this kind of of a person is much more vulnerable much more susceptible mm. to the whole of mirrors effect yes this yeah. kind of person when she sees herself in the mirror and she is suddenly not ugly not stupid not unworthy not inadequate superior amazing she cannot resist this and gives up that's why borderlines for example are very attractive to narcissists it's a mechanism of binding. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the trauma bonding 
by the way, half of all the narcissists are women. So when I say he, it's a she and so on. So, so they, they, they equal themselves. It's not 70 yeah. men, yeah. but now they are. And so there's, um, I, I, I have some question came out. So, um, so this mirroring. So when you spend a lot of time with the narcissistic person, um, I forgot the word, the term, but contagious narcissist, you become a part of part of it. And actually you become kind of a narcissistic or you become like fully narcissistic or you become a kind of narcissist, but not really. Like, how does it work? However, however, you, you uh, accept it by that. You accepted the shared fantasy. Mm. Yes. Okay. That's the, the thing. That's true. Uh, people who are exposed to narcissists mm. suffer trauma. Yeah. This is not an acute trauma, the trauma known as PTSD. It's not. It's another type of trauma known as complex trauma, CPTSD. Now, people with CPTSD and all, everyone who is ex exposed to a narcissist, intimate partner, friend, family, neighbor, priest, doctor, medical doctor, everyone exposed to nothing. Even, by the way, sometimes within a few minutes, suffers trauma. It could be mini, mini, mini trauma. Then he would just feel uncomfortable after after meeting the narcissist. You would feel disgusted. You would feel uncomfortable. You would feel ill at ease. You will want to wash yourself. You will feel... Like you're dirty. Something, something bad happened here. I met some entity. It's not human. Or I don't know what. You, you feel bad. And we call this ego dystony. You will feel ego dystony. So even a short exposure to a narcissist causes trauma. And of course, very long exposure causes massive complex trauma. Now, complex trauma involves elements, psychological elements, psychopathological elements from borderline personality disorder. So it involves emotional dysregulation. Your emotions are so strong, they overwhelm you. You're incapable of managing your emotions. They come, they come suddenly. They take over you. You freeze. You. Uh, this is, this is known as startle response. You. So yeah. your emotions are stronger than you. This is known as emotional dysregulation. This element is borrowed from borderline. You become narcissistic in the sense that your empathy goes down. Your ability to empathize goes down. You become very defensive. Arrogant, more arrogant. Uh, your self-perception and self-image become a lot less realistic, more inflated, more grandiose. These are all narcissistic defenses. Yes. You yes. become dissociative. You begin to forget things a lot. Deny. Or deny things, but also forget, simply forget. So this is dissociative. And oh, what is forgetting things? Because this is really resonating with me in a way. Start to forget things. It's a narcissistic hold, hold defense. Me, me. It's a narcissistic <laughs> defense. The, wow. the narcissist renders you, converts you into a cluster B basket. You become wow. partly borderline, partly narcissist, and partly psychopath. So you will become vengeful, for example. You become vindictive. You become violent, or at least externally aggressive. You will, you will become defiant. You would become contumacious, rejecting authority. Mm. All these are features of complex trauma. To the point that many scholars, including the woman who coined, who invented, who discovered complex trauma, Judith Herman, many scholars, myself included, we propose mm. to consider all cluster B personality disorders as post-traumatic conditions with emotional dysregulation, not mm. as personality disorders. So the victims then, depending on the exposure, depending on the type of narcissist, covert narcissists have much worse effect than overt because they create confusion, disorientation. So depending on many factors, the effects can last a few months, but it's, it's common for the effects to last many years, yeah. five years, six years. Yeah. Okay, that's a good because... No, and another thing is... Just with your permission, another thing, very important thing. The narcissist implants in your head, puts in your head mm -hmm. a voice. This, this process is known as introjection. You introject the narcissist. He, there is a voice in your head 
that represents the narcissist. There's an internal object, which is the representation of the narcissist in your mind. And the narcissist uses something called entraining. Entraining mm -hmm. is simply verbal abuse that keeps repeating itself over and over until you are essentially brainwashed. Yeah. So, and then there is this voice of the narcissist. And even when he's dead, physically dead, or gone, you broke out. You never see him again. You're no contact. You got married, remarried, and you have six children. And you're his, voice, <laughs> his voice is inside your head. So and the problem is this. The narcissist voice inside your head, the narcissist is your enemy, remember, because you broke up with him. You are now the enemy. You are a secondary object. He wants you dead. He wants you finished. He wants you in prison. He wants you whatever. So the narcissist voice inside your head is an enemy voice. And it collaborates with all the other enemy voices in your head. It creates a coalition. So if your mother was an enemy, for example, the narcissist voice would collaborate with your mother's voice. And they would create wow. a coalition introject, introject you into objective coalition. And these voices will attack you together. So when you hear the narcissist's voice in your mind, at the same time, you will hear your mother telling you he is right. He is right about you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if the narcissist tells you, for example, you're so naive, you're such a mm -hmm. people pleaser, mm -hmm. you're so stupid. Suddenly, there will be a second voice, which is essentially your mother's voice, who will tell you, you see I told you the same. You see, I'm right. Yeah. This this is the power of the narcissist. So, in effect, the, we all have introjects from, and we uh, we remember uh, from our childhood because we had to respond to mama's needs, to what what the mother will say. Don't don't go there. Don't do this. Don't behave like this. Don't cross the street without whatever. All the people. All the people you met in your life. Significantly. Important. If all the people you met and you learned something from them to uh, that help you to to you to create your identity. Okay? They are your introjects for life, even though they are dead. This is who you really are. So yeah. you you are defined by other people. In your developing uh, years and uh, people that you may, uh, met when you were experiencing mostly trauma, mostly trauma, because that is hard to overcome. So if you if you don't uh, know how to self care when you're in pain, what you should do, in which narrative actually would sustain your identity, your character that you chose before. You will not feel uh, a, a victim to that extent. You will be more uh, defined as a person. So when uh, the narcissist uh, will come in your environment, you have to, to meet uh, and you have sense for you. Already you develop sense of who you are, then it would what you will when you will meet a narcissist, charming, whatever, or overt, the you will ask yourself, what's wrong? These are the red flags, you know, uh, what women are talking. But when you will meet a psychopath, you don't have to exchange a word. If your senses are uh, in in uh, attuned. in balance, attuned with your with your emotions, with your reasoning, with your personality, okay? When you will meet a uh, psychopath, you want to run. You, will, you don't need to, to, to say a word. They are, uh, you will feel fear. You will be afraid. Uh, and that's why Sam said uh, you sweat and you want to, to take a shower after that, like you, you are dirty. Many people experience that. But yeah. and what I'm saying, and uh, to my clients, I'm counselor for CPTSD, mm -hmm. is to to go back to their own uh, senses, senses, and to uh, try to experience many more other things, and uh, to reconnect them, to reframe them uh, with the introject 
the experiences that they had before. So they will, you know, like negate the positive experiences today will negate the, the bad introjects from before. So in this way, uh, we call it, I call it reframing. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a pretty good new start. And uh, many, because you said that you, you feel some resonance, that's why I'm <laughs> giving you this. Many people should just be uh, to, from time to time, remind themselves, okay, you are living with, with a narcissistic husband. You know, it is ex expected from him. I know who, now everyone, what Sam said in the beginning, they have a definition, a language, right? They can define and they will know with whom they are dealing and how to protect themselves. We all have that power because the life in us uh, pushes us to just survive and you will survive a narcissist. As simple as that. No need to complicate things, no need to go, you know, to make a lot of drama because this border is borderline joke. <laughs> Not the normal persons or the victims. No victim, uh, no victim uh, 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 says uh, that is suffering. He is saying, mm -hmm. he said to you, my long, or he introduces me like long suffering wife. I don't see it as I'm suffering. I'm learning from it. I, I am thankful because I discover my dark side. I know okay. what I'm made of. So who who gets the the best part of the cake? Hmm? Let's share it. And again, and again, it's a question of calculus. It's a mathematical question. If the vast majority of introjects in your inside your head are negative the narcissist would have a much easier job of taking over you and you will have a much more difficult job of getting rid of his voice in your mind because he would have many more allies inside your mind. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if your upbringing and childhood and later life, majority of the voices inside your head are loving and caring and supportive and helpful, and then the narcissist would have a much more difficult job to take over you you will probably get rid of a narcissist much earlier yeah. and the narcissist voice inside your mind will be silenced by the others, especially yeah. by your authentic voice. Every human being has a single voice, which is that person, not mother, not father, not family, not friends, that person's voice. It's known as the authentic voice. So it depends. Narcissists who target damaged and broken women do it for a purpose. They're much easier to convert. Right, of course. <laughs> much easier to convert. And much easier to hoover. Mm. Even after there's a breakup, and you know, it's much easier to reacquire them, to get them back. Because yes. the voice is there. It, the Trojan horse is inside the mind. It's there, it's working. You know. Okay, I have... Um... I've also, um, okay, I I'll ask you three questions, uh, I think, because before I forget. <laughs> so, um, the second grade supply or first grade supply, and who really becomes first grade and who becomes second grade, first of all. And second, um, I read a lot on your book and listened that narcissism never heals, which is quite sad. But then now you said this contagious narcissist people can heal after a few years or a few months which is a good news. And um, the third question is, what is the difference, really difference between psychopathic person and narcissists? I think there's a difference between empathy because I recall you talked about cold empathy. Narcissistic people have some sort of empathy called cold empathy, but psychopaths have no empathy at all. Is this true? Mm, no, I'll start with the last question. Both of them have mm. cold empathy. Mm. Both narcissists and psychopaths have called them. But the difference between narcissists and psychopaths is that psychopaths are goal-oriented, and the goal could be sex, money, power, access, luxury life, whatever. The narcissist is not goal-oriented. His only goal is narcissistic supply. So the narcissist is a junkie. The psychopath is an operative, functional entity that maximizes or optimizes outcomes. The narcissist is a junkie. And he's after supply. So therefore, the psychopath is not dependent on other people. 
He is mm-hmm. ironically not pro-social and communal as the narcissist. The narcissist depends on other people for narcissistic supply. So he must work with other people, he must please other people, he must somehow interact with other people. He suffers. <laughs> he is integrated with other people, he hates other people, he holds other people in contempt because he is godlike and superior, but unfortunately he is dependent on other people for narcissistic supply. Mm. A psychopath is not. The psychopath very often is a loner, a lone wolf. He mm. doesn't care about other people because they, there's nothing they can give him except, for example, money. So he doesn't care what they think about him. He doesn't need supply. None of this. Plus, many of the features of narcissism do not exist in psychopathy. Online, there are many self-styled experts. It's a catastrophic phenomenon. They are spreading. They are spreading misinformation left, right, and center. It's a disaster. Mm. And some of these experts have academic degrees. Some of them are even psychologists, but they are not experts on narcissism. So. Some of these so-called experts are saying that all psychopaths are narcissists. That is rank nonsense. Only a small percentage of psychopaths are also narcissists. Mm -hmm. The overwhelming majority of uh, psychopaths are not. They're grandiose, but they're not narcissists. Mm -hmm. So no no dependency on other people. And the, the psychological composition or landscape of narcissism is not the same like psychopaths. For example, psychopaths don't have dissociation, don't, can, mm-hmm. don't engage in fantasy, do not, do not have uh, the same kind of shared fantasy like the narcissist. Don't, uh, they, so the differences are huge. I would even say that psychopathy should not be a mental health issue, should not be defined as a clinical entity. A psychopath is simply who ref- someone who refuses to play by the rules. Mm. Refuses to play by the rules and doesn't care about other people. But he recognizes, for example, that other people are external to him. Not like mm. the narcissist. He is firmly embedded in reality. Psychopath is very grounded in reality. Narcissist is not. Mm-hmm. Psychopath couldn't care less what you think about him. Narcissist will fall apart if you don't give him supply. Mm-hmm. If these are critical differences. So I don't think so. I think psychopathy is wrongly defined as a mental health issue. It's a social problem, not a mental health problem. And um, so this is with regards to the second. With regards to your first question. In my early work, I, I suggested that not all supply is the same. Depends who is the source of narcissistic supply. If I get a compliment from Albert Einstein. It's not the same if I get a compliment from the from my neighbor, yes. obviously. If Einstein says you're a genius, or my neighbor says I'm a genius, it's not the same. It doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't last as long. So I suggested that there are grades of narcissism. I also suggested that there is fake, fake supply. Fake supply is when you pretend to give me supply, but I realize that you are trying to play me, to game me, to deceive me, to manipulate me. You're giving me supply to manipulate. This is fake supply. There is low-grade supply that comes from idiots, and I don't know what. It means nothing to me. On the contrary, it may even insult me. It may even have the... So there's negative supply. Negative supply is something that looks like supply, sounds like supply, but actually causes me narcissistic injury. Mm-hmm. So they are, there's a whole theory of supply. It's, uh, it's very detailed, very... I forgot what was the second question, which proves that I'm not a genius. Yeah, oh. Do they heal? So they never heal. Oh, healing, healing, no. yeah. True. Heal. The victims of narcissistic abuse do not become narcissists. Mm-hmm. Everyone has narcissistic defenses. Every human being alive and many human beings dead have narcissistic defenses. So the narcissist triggers your narcissistic defenses. The narcissist also provokes psychopathic behaviors and the narcissist dysregulates you emotionally so you look a lot like a borderline. But it doesn't mean that you become a borderline or that you become a narcissist or that you become a psychopath. No. CPTSD is transitory and that's the difference between CPTSD and borderline personality disorder. That's why it is nonsense. Again, self-styled experts online are saying 
CPTSD is borderline. No, it's not. Borderline is lifelong. It ameliorates. It's mitigated in the, in, in the patient's 40s. When the patient is 40, 45, borderline goes down. But it's, it's lifelong. It starts at age 12. CPTSD is always transient. It lasts a few months, a few years in extreme cases, and then it disappears. It reverses completely. The very good news, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it is. Prognosis is very good. So, so will okay. narcissism ever heal? No. Narcissism yeah. is not narcissism is not a new fashion. You can take off your clothes. Narcissistic personality disorder is the personality. This is who the narcissist is. That's the essence of the narcissist. If you take away the narcissistic personality disorder, nothing is left behind. There's also nothing to work with in, with a patient that is outside the disorder. That's why the DSM says that narcissistic personality disorder is all pervasive. Yeah. It permeates everything. Every emotion, every cognition, every affect, every field of functioning, every area of life, every behavior, every trait, every reaction, every everything is affected and defined by pathological narcissism. There's no way to take it away because then there would be no patient left. So you okay. know, narcissism cannot be healed. What can be done is to modify some abrasive and antisocial behaviors of the narcissist, to teach the narcissist to be more socially acceptable, to sublimate, to convert some things into socially acceptable behaviors, and so on and so forth. Even then, it's very short-term effect. You, you, work, forget. you work with the narcissist for three years, and you're very happy and you're, you're, you, are, you become a narcissist yourself. I, I, I healed that narcissist. He now knows how to behave in society. He's not insulting people. He's not exploiting people. He's not manipulating people. He's not abusing people. Wonderful. In essence, he's no longer a narcissist. I modified all his behaviors. And if you're lucky, this lasts for six months. Or until the narcissist is stressed. Or until he thinks that you've insulted him. Mm. It's nonsense. It's simply yeah. nonsense. There's no way to change a narcissist. And victims would do well to stop with malignant optimism and what Shadow the Angelis, uh, a narcissism uh, uh, Instagrammer, calls pathological hope. They would do well to get rid of this. Yeah. It's a take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. That's yes. the narcissist forever. You want to take it? Take it with your eyes open. Build your defenses. Enhance your positive introjects, put up a firewall, yeah. and survive next to the narcissist, benefiting from his good sides. Because, for example, some narcissists are intelligent and can teach you a few things. Some, some are fun. Some are fun. Some, you know. But don't tell yourself, "I'm going to transform the narcissist with my love. I'm no. going to heal. I'm going to heal his inner child and his wounds." This yeah. is grandiose. This is grandiosity to think that you could have any impact on the narcissist where tens of thousands of scholars and therapists have failed. Yeah. To think that you will be the one. This is grandiose. You can change it. Yeah. Um, so um, the last question, because I set my time and I can see I have 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, we can talk more on this subject. Maybe if you agree, maybe we could talk uh, another time. <laughs> Possibly, yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, um, how do we prevent our children to become narcissists in the future? Yes, Lydia. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I had uh, my own uh, uh, problems I wanted mm -hmm. to resolve. I went into child psychology much deeper. And I... There was a summit of resilience. How to, what was important, uh, not to to be more resilient, resilient to narcissists, resilient to psychopaths, resilient is simple. To learn, 
to learn uh, and children should be encouraged to learn at all times uh, their parents should be aware should be aware what are their uh, expectations of the child and not to yeah. enforce them impose them uh, in effect you uh, when I face parents I tell them look uh, you are both narcissistic I don't yeah. we all are but if I will know what is your narcissistic trait I will tell you how not to express it to your child so awareness of narcissism uh, by both parents uh, defining the traits and influences uh, on their children so they will protect the child of pain, of emotional pain and uh, to let the child, to, you know, to encourage the child to experience more and more things by explaining at the same time what, what is going on there. So if uh, this is a cup this is a cup made of this, to smallest detail, to just for the child to get first the orientation of the environment. So uh, to, to recognize the objects, to recognize the, the environment, so they can have uh, their self of uh, being capable of sustaining themselves, to be more, uh, to, to be aware, to just get um to teach the child to self-care to be more uh more aware of the environment what was boundaries so just a second this is between this is the first uh first stage between two four five years the mm -hmm. boundaries uh uh they will what he mentioned when the child after two years will start to to uh, be exposed to other, to their peers. They are going into the world. They will have to socialize. So the parents should enforce the, I mean, should make it, you know, uh, more pleasurable uh, social uh, gaining uh, to allow their friends with their children to, to come to them, they will go to them you know, uh, to meet, to have some uh, uh, times together, to be more happy, to make uh, why interesting things. Not as I witness and as I see, they take their mobiles, they put cartoons. Now you see it. No, the children should be engaged in the conversation. Never mind if it is tough or not. If they will not understand, and if they will ask the parent to explain, yes, the parent to be to explain it, uh, not to spare the, ch the child of being hurt, because yeah. uh, this is the way how the child will experience what is hurt, will learn what is hurt. Then the mother sh uh, should uh, tell the child, this is how you will protect whenever you will see that someone, in, a child with a stone in, in, in the hand, you don't stand. You just go. Uh, you 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 don't ask what is his attention. You you will just put yourself out of the way of his way. You understand? These are these are the uh, things that the mother mother because she the child has most confidence in the mother. She know the child knows that the mother will never abandon her him. Then uh, when uh, the child child uh, trusts the mother first uh, actually um, trusts anyone who cares but the mother should also make that distinction uh, distinct, to make that uh, distinction. Uh, distinction not to uh, to to uh, show the child that he cannot uh, that she he the child will, uh, should not trust the a uh, guy with a stone in the head. You understand? Yeah. Um, to show the differences. Mother's role, father's role. Ah, to teach the child in the formative years uh, to get a sense, to develop the senses from the environment when the child will enter the second phase 
when uh, we'll start to socialize, we'll be ready to enable, uh, we'll be enabled to make the difference, what is good, what is right, okay? So they will, the child will be more, uh, will uh, have more, uh, will okay. trust, confidence, mm -hmm. the self-esteem will be good enough. So, and also in this age, when they are socializing, uh, it's very narcissistic uh, trait, but if they are not uh, narcissists, they will not <laughs> uh see what they are made of well mm -hmm. they are very competitive so mm -hmm. uh, the mother should regulate the parents should regulate the competitiveness uh, competitiveness that doesn't mean if uh the guy has a has a some toy that they should buy it to their children they should say but he likes it why would you like to have that so uh there are ways of uh doing that but uh, uh, for uh, for a child not to become narcissist later is to teach him how to care of uh, himself herself with the uh, with the emotionally uh, uh, to enable him enable the child to connect with others because narcissists don't connect with anyone because that is also part of the environment not only the object but also the people. So, and how to be fair in a, in a sense. Yes, do, uh, uh, the child should be provoked. They see uh, uh, when uh, with, uh, in social milieu, they, they are fights and so on. Yes, you should fight for yourself. I will teach you how to fight. You know, it's not like, okay, you should not fight. The uh, parents should uh, teach the child how to preserve what they think of them that was validated by the parents and the others until then so it's, it's and it's ever it's changing parenting, parenting is complicated though by mm -hmm. by social media the online environment mm -hmm. social media were constructed around narcissistic uh, traits so social mm -hmm. media encourage shame by comparing yourself to others yes. social media encourage envy of course with likes and so on and so forth Social media encourage grandiosity. So there is a problem with exposure to the online world, which mm. complicates parenting, even good parenting. Makes it almost, I would say, impossible. Suicides among, uh, among young people have increased by 48% in the last decade. Wow. 48%. These are the children of the trans transitional generation. This number is nothing compared to the following numbers. Depression is increased by 300%. Anxiety is increased by 500% among young people. What's happening to the world? <laughs> I think um, we have relegated the role of parenting to technology companies. Mm. Starting with television, long before internet. Long before internet, mothers used to put children in front of television. That's true. The TV uh, raises the children. Yes. <laughs> now the computer raises the children. Yes. Well, okay. So we have only two minutes because I set the timing. I think it, it ends, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you so much. I I also have a lot of new information just talking to you aside from the books. And I really would like to talk to both of you again and let me know if you have time. <laughs> um, we have you can also arrange. You can also arrange if you wish. You can arrange a public podcast, so you yes. can invite. You can invite people to a to a place, and it can be projected on a screen. Yeah, and I could give a lecture, for example, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, why not? Yeah, and they could ask questions. The audience can ask questions. So it's done in many countries. You can mm -hmm. just put many people in a hall, a lecture hall, and a screen, and project the image on the screen. So today yes. technology helps us to connect. Yeah. Yes, that's the advantage. We are here. <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, I'm so afraid it's going to end. And thank then you. let's talk again. And the opening of the book is on 13th, next Wednesday. And Wonderful. I'll send you this, uh, next week. No I'll worries. go to the book. <laughs> thank, okay. thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much. much. We're very excited. Thank, thank you. you very yes. much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice day there. Bye. Bye for Bye -bye. now. Bye for now. Thank you.